for a period of a few months in the early 1980s, maybe like 1981, 1982, something like that, I was in a, uh, a group in Newcastle upon Tyne, and it was a what's called a men's group. You don't get men's groups anymore. But at the time, they were sort of popular. They were kind of a, a sympathetic response to feminism. Uh, it was like a discussion group, you know, where you sit around and talk about what it is to be a, a man in changing times. And looking back on it, you know, a lot of it was pretty twee, really, and a bit, a bit kind of womb envious, I suppose. Uh, and one of the things that uh, it's actually very, very interesting in many other ways, and I met some really nice people, and it was great actually. But uh, one of the things that I've thought about since, and that was, I guess, part of the what became known as the men's movement as well at the time. Uh, was this idea of getting in touch with your feelings. That was very popular in the early 1980s, getting in touch, men getting in touch with their feelings. I guess the idea was a, a kind of uh, post or sub-Freudian idea that, uh, that, uh, that men had these feelings which they were kind of pushing down or repressing or suppressing or doing something with, uh, and pushing them down into, this, uh, into the bilges of their psyche. And then at some point they would come bursting forth in the form of rage or anger or something like that. Um, particularly uh, upsetment, that was particularly emotion that men were supposed to not be able to get in touch with. And so for a brief period of time, as I say in the early 1980s, it was very popular for men to cry a lot. And that kind of reached uh, um, its culmination actually at the back end of the 80s, early 90s, with the footballer Paul Gascoigne crying. Uh, during the World Cup, but there was a whole process of things that led up to that. I think, and and men crying was a big deal at the time. Uh, but it's, it, I just think it's, there's something very odd about the whole process, really. And I think I mean I think the idea of getting in touch with your feelings, the, I better call it, getting in touch with your emotions, which is such a daft cliche and a very cheesy idea. I think there's some. I think there's still some mileage in that. But I think where it takes you to is not a situation in which men burst into tears at the top of the hat, uh, or indeed that men have these suppressed emotions which burst forth into testosterone-fueled rage, but leads to a different place. The idea of uh, getting in touch with your emotions, first off, I mean, my reading of that comes out of um, Antonio Damasio, comes out of uh, Mela Ponzi, and I guess comes out of William James, ultimately which is this idea that uh, we have these things called emotions, which are physical embodied responses, visceral responses to a situation, or to an imagined situation. And they might be things like hormonal changes, they might be muscle tightenings, they might be kind of biochemical and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, physical changes to the body. And those are somatically tagged for some kind of emotional valency or value uh, and this is all non-conscious. We don't notice these things are happening. Um, and they're kind of preparing those uh, uh, valences, those values, like emotional tagging, somatic tagging, is preparing the body for some kind of response, a fight or flight response, for example. Um, and that's fine. All animals, including humans, of course, have those kind of emotions. Uh, what's uh, distinct, perhaps, about animals, about humans, and perhaps the primates, is that we have also these things called feelings, which I think it's Merleau-Ponty says it's the conscious perception of unconscious emotions. So in addition to having this emotional set driven by the body's responses, we are also capable of kind of um, yeah, well, perceiving that, having a, a kind of second order uh, set, of, a set of perceptions of those emotions, almost as if the emotions are kind of surface that you can run your hands over. These bodily responses are creating indentations in the surface. And if it's unpleasant, if those are unpleasant sensations, when you run your hand over, it's brittle and it's sharp and it's jagged and it's got an unpleasant texture, and you feel that texture. And if it's a pleasant set of bodily responses, then you run your hand over and it's a much more uh, sensuous experience, much more arousing, perhaps. So, but, it's, but the feelings are the feeling of this imaginary surface, in, at least in the way I'm talking about it. Uh, so in that regard, 
being in touch with your emotions is a good thing if it allows you to uh, kind of run your hands over the surface and understand the messages that your body is giving you. Uh, and there's a com like a completely physical version of that would be, you know, sticking your hand in a fire and feeling the heat. If you don't feel the heat, I mean literally feel it as pain, then you, do, you would just keep your hand there and you'd end up with a damaged hand. So it has that kind of uh, survival value, I think. Why I say that doesn't necessarily or shouldn't necessarily lead to uh, endless crying fests is um, that if you truly are in, uh, in touch with your emotions and you are capable of of, um, of you know kind of running your hands and detecting the kind of braille of this uh, of these thematic responses, then you don't get yourself into a situation in the first place where you have to cry. I mean, obviously things happen, you know bad things happen in the world, things are out of control sometimes, but a lot of the time we are in control of what we do and where we go and what the kind of situation we get ourselves in. And if we are literally in touch with our emotions in the way that I'm talking about and that Damasio talks about, then um, then we can, we get the sense that we're doing something stupid and potentially painful very early on, like moving our hands slowly towards the fire. As soon as you feel the warmth, you think, hang on, it's getting a bit warm, so I better not move my hand any further closer. So it's that kind of a thing. Um, I mean, in fact, and, and, it's, and I think Damasio talks about it in terms of intelligence. You know, if you've got a fully functioning set of feelings, i.e. If you, if you are in touch with your emotions in the way that I'm using it, then it guides intelligence decision-making. And you can uh, make smart choices so you don't get yourself into situations where suddenly your world falls apart uh, because you made such a series of bad decisions earlier on. Uh, yeah, I think that, that kind of makes sense. And, you, and you'll cry as a result. I mean, if, I think if you're um, if you're attuned enough, if you're you know running your hand over the surface often enough and have enough relationship with those somatic markers and and uh, are in touch with your emotions enough, you wouldn't actually notice the. Um, you wouldn't notice that you were responding to those things. I, I, I imagine it would become second nature. It would become almost an unconscious process. You would. Your actions would just be wise. You would just make good choices without even thinking about it. And it would never arise to you that you would. That you were shying away from a negative response or even particularly moving towards a good one you would just be making good choices you would uh, kind of flow from one good choice to the next so much as I had enjoyed my time with the men's group in Newcastle in the early 1980s I really did uh, getting in touch with your feelings or getting in touch with your emotions at that time uh, I think it needed a bit more work it shouldn't really result in men crying all the time, which, let's face it, is just embarrassing.